Welcome, Revenge Seekers. Early 3D was an interesting time for game development. For a lot of developers and designers, that step into another dimension was a level of immersion that was entirely new to them. When Doom came out, one of the reasons that it made waves was because exploring a 3D space like that was something that people hadn't experienced before. It was like another world that really existed, persistently, in more dimensions and visual detail than most people were used to. Because of that, attempts at atmospheric immersion were popular. The only problem was, nobody really knew how to make a 3D space play well yet, and designing areas for this was hard due to it being both new and the technical limitations. Everything fell into a space of experimentation, and it led to all sorts of different and odd games to be worked on that we'd otherwise not get. In 1996, three short years after Doom, 3D space wasn't entirely figured out yet for most developers. It's the year we saw Duke Nukem 3D, Quake, and Super Mario 64. These games really are the forerunners in terms of design for 3D games later on, as developers still largely struggled with controls and level design in a non-2D format back then. The technology and complexity of what could be done was rapidly moving forward and at a faster pace than most companies could program for. A good number of the fondly remembered games of this time are still 2D, like Super Mario RPG, Metal Slug, and Kirby Superstar. The Super Nintendo still had a pretty strong hand, while the PlayStation 1 and Nintendo 64 started their next generation of output. In this time, Tecmo released a game that experimented a lot with the look and design of a 3D space in Tecmo's Deception, Invitation to Darkness. Deception, Invitation to Darkness has you take the role of the Crown Prince, recently returning home from his vacation. Your father, the King, wants to have a word with you about successorship. Because he feels confident that the new generation is ready to take the stage, and just as he's about to pass the torch, he's suddenly murdered in front of you. Shortly after, your younger brother runs in and has you arrested for the crime, demanding you be executed. As the peasants cheer for your execution, you damn them all. Wishing for the power to end their miserable lives yourself for how they've all betrayed you. And then, you're given that power. You wake up in front of a castle, and after killing its former master, you're put in charge of it by a cool-looking pale lady. This is now your castle. The Castle of the Damned. So the cool thing that you instantly get to do as the master of this new castle is designing it yourself. You're given free reign to make hallways and rooms and just expand the place as you see fit on top of the original design. The editor for this is fairly simple. It's a console game released in 1996, so you can't expect the level of building tools you'd get in the likes of Dungeon Keeper on PC. It would be a pretty big issue in terms of save files. But what is there is pretty nice. You can make it as much of a labyrinth or regular mansion as you want, with the two floors that you get to work with. And at any time, you're allowed to go back into the editor to adjust it. I kind of like how this adds to the mystical nature a lot of games with overlords in castles tend to have. Like the Castlevania games and how they've alluded to the ever-shifting nature of the castle layout between games. As Lord of the Castle, it's your turn to build a castle of your own design. It does come at a cost, though. The game takes 9 blocks on a PlayStation 1 memory card. A regular first-party memory card has 15 blocks. This isn't such a big deal now if you emulate it, but that's still a lot of space, especially when it came out. 
You would have to dedicate half of a memory card to one single game, and I don't think most people would actually appreciate that. So why would you want a modular castle then? Because it's yours to fill with traps as you see fit. Tecmo's Deception, Invitation to Darkness, is basically home alone if Macaulay Culkin was a Satanist and wanted to sacrifice Marvin Harry's souls to the devil. You guys give up? Oh yeah, thirsty for more. Every stage, guests will come to visit you in your castle. Some seeking the power that you're also after. Some come to stop you. There are people there simply out of greed, as there's a large bounty put on your head as more and more people go missing near the castle and rumors start spreading about who it is that is responsible for all of this. This doesn't mean the people there are all evil, selfish, or that you're punishing them. A good number of people invading the castle are normal, innocent people. Like early on in the game, you're met by a married couple desperate to get the money for an operation that could save their daughter. Out of desperation, they plead for your death so their child can live. Every stage opens with the ability to look into the bio of each visitor, to determine their stats and decide how to approach them, but also giving you some background info on them. Some of them are good people, only here because you killed people that they care about, others are rotten enough to betray one another, or were just there to intercept other guests and murder them before robbing the place. So how do you dispose of them? Well, you could ask them if they like feet. There are no direct means of combat in Deception. All you have is the ability to place traps from the same menu that you can change the dungeon layout in before the start of the stage, or at certain rooms within the castle. At first I expected this to become really cumbersome, as the game only gives you one room to do this in on the second floor, but later on they open up two more rooms to let you access these things, and then also gives you the ability to warp to them. So let's talk traps. Traps come in three varieties, and two flavors. Every trap I'm going to talk about has a magic and attack version, and they're kind of the same thing except one goes through magic defense and the other goes through physical defense, and there's no real difference outside of that. You have three categories for traps, capturing, hurting, or confusing guests. The confusion traps give guests a small debuff that makes them more susceptible to other traps for a period of time. It's a similar state to the dazed state that they're in after being hurt, but without the damage and often longer timers to their affliction. Capture traps allow you to capture your guests, as the name implies. Once they're locked in place, you have to stand in front of them to make sure that they are captured. Every trap gives a timer for how long they'll be pinned down, and you have to make sure your capturing time fits within that time frame. Pokemon who are hurt or confused are easier to capture. Once a guest is captured, you're given two choices. Kill them for their money, or drain their soul for MP. Money is what you use to expand the castle, and P is what you use to place traps. Traps meant to hurt guests can kill them. Killing a guest makes them drop a bag of gold. Whether you capture or kill a guest, they'll often give you items after you're done with them. Items to boost your stats, remove status afflictions, or heal yourself. So let's talk a bit about the differences between these traps and why capturing is for losers. You know how I said that capturing lets you choose between MP and gold? Well, that choice means that if you go for MP, you're not getting that gold. Which is fair enough, but at the end of the stage, you get bonus points for either capturing all your guests or murdering them. The genocide bonus gives you less MP than the all capture one, but here's the catch. There's also bonuses for how long you took and how many traps were successful from the ones you used. Traps that kill have a higher success rate than traps that capture. So by killing your guests instead of capturing them, you get more bonus points for being faster and more efficient on top of generally having to place less traps to begin with. You also never have to stand in front of a pinned down guest while their allies trying to kill you, so you're also more likely to get bonuses for how much health you have left. So not only do you get more money for killing them, you typically get way more MP back than you have to spend to clear the stage. And that's not even taking the items that replenish MP into account that a lot of the enemies drop. I get what they were trying to go for with the trade-off, but it's not balanced in a way that pans out positively to the capturing side at all. And another similar problem comes up in terms of balancing when you can upgrade your traps. 
This costs money, so if you spent your efforts capturing guests, upgrading traps could be difficult to begin with. You know that thing that games do when they want equipment to go up in damage output without rendering the previous stuff entirely useless? So the idea is to lower the accuracy for the stronger stuff or make it less cost efficient or harder to upkeep? Stronger traps not just do more damage, but are also more accurate. The third tier of really high damage dealing traps are more accurate than the first tier cheap traps meant to focus on accuracy. Which means you now have traps that are extra accurate and can kill in one or two hits, making that timer bonus even higher. I wish there was more of a risk reward thing going on here, because I do like trapping enemies, luring them towards their inevitable end before pulling the trigger on them, but objectively best tools are a bit easy to get your hands on. Wait, did I just kill Mandalore? Traps in general can have some issues. This is a very early 3D game, so you can't really expect clean movement like we often can expect from them now. Of course, the game doesn't expect you to be as comfortable walking around in 3D spaces as we generally are now. Skill demand isn't too high, the most that's ever expected of you is to be able to dodge a slow-moving projectile that gets fired maybe every 3 seconds or so. But there's also a problem with the trap ranges. Sometimes guests warp right to the center of a trap to get hit with the proper trap animation, Sometimes the game recognizes the trap is going now and pushes them out of the center square to play the animation as it misses the target it was supposed to hit. Even if it seems like it was dead center. Consistency is not always the best here, and it can be frustrating at times. And since traps basically work in a sense where guests hit by it, play a special animation with a trap, it also means that there are no things like damage radiuses or splash damage. An explosion will only hurt the one guest that's playing the animation that goes with the trap because they're in it. Another guest can walk right through the animation and be perfectly fine. This also makes traps that supposedly miss despite looking on target look really weird. Though there is another mechanic I'm overlooking here, simply because I looked at the footage of people using it after it unlocked and just deciding not to bother. After capturing guests, you can lead them to your prison as another choice, so you can convert them into monsters that then attack other guests later on, which means another layer of AI in this game. So let's talk about the AI in this game. It's not great. Though at least the developers seemed aware of it. A lot of my time was spent luring guests towards my traps. The most straightforward way is to just stand in front of them so they move forward and then lead them on towards where you want them to go. This becomes an issue with ranged enemies, especially around doors. The moment that they lose sight of you, they'll often just go another way and it can make things very frustrating. There is a solution to this in the form of masks though. You get a set of special masks that cost mana to use, and upon using them, they'll manipulate the AI based on categories. Some lure the vengeful, others chase away the easily scared. It's an extra way to get clumsy AI to do what you want and make it less likely to get stuck presented in a way that fits the theming of the game. I really have to give the game credit for its presentation and theming in general. The atmosphere and deception is fantastic. The music does a good job at setting an airy mood, and the idea that it's a mysterious dark castle in the middle of the night is a good framing for the low drawing distance. Look at the textures loading in awkwardly the way it does. I didn't know that the Unreal 3 engine was already developed in 1996. You can always hear the footsteps of guests from a distance, which is a really great way to set the mood. Footsteps are always someone out there trying to kill you while you're out there in this castle, unarmed. It's also a great way to tell where they are without looking at the map. It's pretty good sound design for back then. Oh, and speaking of those masks that you get and how they fit into the theming, one of the masks is the Mean Laugh Mask, made to attract people seeking revenge, and it looks a lot like the mask the previous owner was wearing when you entered the castle, seeking revenge. Huh.
And there's a mask that draws in the curious that has the same laugh that was used to initially draw you here. I don't think people are being honest here. <laughs> After most stages, you get the option to lure in more people to the castle so you can murder them. You're allowed to pick specific types of people to stop by, which is meant to help you stock up guest types for the monster creation aspect of the game. You get six choices, though you can actually only lure in four guests. There's a random chance that decides if you succeeded or failed to lure them in. There's multiple endings to the game, depending on choices that you made during your playthrough. Most of them tend to be based on fairly straightforward dialogue options during the game, and the outcomes differ quite a bit. I looked up the other endings on YouTube after I beat the game, and I think it's safe to say that I like the one that I got the best. I'm not going to spoil it in this video, so if you know the game, you can always ask what I got in the comment section and I will just tell you. Tecmo's Deception is an interesting game. For every mechanic, I have at least one or two issues, and yet these issues don't overpower what I like from them. I still enjoyed my time with the game, and I found it very interesting to play around with. Maybe it's my weak spot for being able to make my own home base. Maybe I just like placing traps and toying with enemies in games. Though the blunt way in which the game just makes you a Satanist while trying to resurrect the devil by sacrificing innocent lives to him is certainly something you don't see too often. And you don't see it later into the series anymore either. The other Deception games look and play very differently from this one. The Satanism angle wasn't a good look for a game releasing in the West during the 90s. One of the enemy types are basically children, and yes, you can lure them to your castle between stages too, which isn't really helping its reputation a lot. Not only did things get changed for later games, the first Deception game never got a re-release in the West. Other changes for later games include the first-person perspective being dropped for a third-person view. Though that's something we'll have to cover in another video, as this game did intrigue me enough to look at the rest of the series. If you can withstand early 3D jank and love good theming, Try Deception out sometime. It is really good. Anyway, this was above up and, uh... <laughs> Art, I don't want to alarm you, but there may be a boogeyman or boogeyman in the house! <laughs> Hey, we actually got a Sonic High School video out. We did it! It's not the fanfiction thing that I wanted to do after finishing the first season of Sonic High School. Um, that is still gonna come at some point in the future. It's just really hard to record and I haven't really been in the frame of mind to do it. My voice hasn't been great and I was sick for a long while and you know, all of that is done. But it's still something that if I record it, my voice is gonna go away for a full day and I can't do that every single day. So. That other series is gonna happen when I have a season done, basically. But in the meantime, Sonic High School is back, so I hope people enjoy that. I really do. It's, it's fun to record and it's fun to edit. It's probably the most fun I actually have on the channel right now. And I'm glad that people indulge me in this. And when I say that we're gonna do Deception 2 very soon, I actually mean very, very soon. I actually really look forward to uh, Kagero Deception. That was actually the main reason that I wanted to get into this. As always, this video has been brought to you by people supporting me on Patreon. If you would like to become one of the people that you see scrolling on the screen right now, you can head over to patreon.com slash above up and I will, uh, see ya.